Hi, welcome to Lessons in Humanities. Today I'm going to teach you a little bit about colonial society in British America. Before I start, if you're interested in this presentation or the timeline that I have in this presentation or any other lesson plans or activities uh, that you would like to use with your students or if you're your student and you want to learn more, uh, please visit my my uh, TPT store. Uh, I have the, the details in the in the the um, description below. But uh, the main idea here for this lesson is about colonial society in British America. It's going to concentrate mostly on the 1700s and a little bit about the 1600s. Uh, but this is a time when the British colonies were developing in British America and the cities were getting bigger and more people were arriving and um, the common man could afford more luxury goods better than the 1600s when it was very challenging especially in the early 1600s uh, so i always start my lesson with a with a timeline and again if you're interested in this timeline i have timelines from 1492 all the way to 2020 uh, in my store please check below uh, but what we have here is uh, time period two so time period one goes from the native american cultures to the to the new Spain, to the Spanish in the, in the New World. And it talks about Columbus and Hernan Cortez and uh, you know them looking for gold and becoming very, very rich and uh, powerful during this time period. Most people don't know, but it's more than 100 years before the, the English ever arrive in uh, the New World. It's going to be in 1607, and that's the beginning of this timeline. 1607 is chosen because... That's when Jamestown, the first permanent English colony, was, was settled. You know, the first couple of years were terrible. There was a starving period in 1609 to 1610 where people were literally eating uh, corpses. There's even a story of a man who killed his wife uh, to eat her. It was terrible times. They didn't know how to live the land. These were like business people, right? They're not survivalists. And they needed the help from the local uh, Native Americans. And so with the, the pilgrims and the Puritans up in New England. But as 1600s went by, they found tobacco and they were able to sell it. And more and more people from Britain uh, or England came to uh, British America. Uh, more and more colony, colonies developed, right? It would be over a period of about 150 years before all 13 colonies would be founded, right? It's not like it was like, okay, 13 colonies, let's start the United States of America. Uh, this took over a, a long period of time with more people coming and people having babies and population growing um, up into you know the mid early 1700s when Georgia the the, the last of the 13 colonies was was settled um, and then at the end of this time period will be at the end of my lecture here it's uh, 1754 this is seven years war also known uh, as a French and Indian war and it would be the French and their Indian allies fighting the British and their Indian allies. This would be a world war. But this day is very important in American history for numerous reasons. Number one, the French, who had more territory than the British in, in the New World, uh, would, would be defeated. And the British territory would be so big and unmanageable, right? Uh, but also, this would directly lead to the, the American Revolution, which would begin the United States of America. Now, colonial America, British America, you know, after some time, uh, you know, at first it was only the rich people that could afford uh, luxury goods, right? Maybe a nice dress or some drapes or curtains for the window or a teapot. Uh, especially in the early 1600s, if you want a chair, you're going to have to make that chair. If you want some food, you're going to have to grow that food. Well, this brings us into the consumer revolution. So by the 1700s, uh, common people, not just the rich elites, but common people could purchase things. They could buy things. They don't have to make that chair. They can buy the chair. Um, maybe they want something luxurious, something they don't need, right? Like a nice teapot, right? Um, or some type of special clothes. Um, this is known as a consumer revolution. Manufacturing got better. Transportation got better. And the availability of credit and money made it possible so just a common person could buy these things. Now, not the slaves or the indentured servants or the very poor workers, uh, but the middle class. Now they could afford things. It's not just for the rich, right? And it becomes like a status symbol. 
kind of like today, a car or an iPhone could be a status symbol. This was like a status symbol for um, many, many people back then to have some type of luxury goods. And this all became available uh, in, in the 1700s, late 1600s, 1700s. Uh, at this time, too, there's the growth of cities. There's um, bigger cities, more people in these cities. You know, more people, for various reasons, are coming from Europe, not just England, but other, other countries. Uh, because they want to buy land, you know, maybe they're really poor. There was a population boom, 1600s in, in England. Uh, people want to come to this, this new world and buy land and, uh, and become wealthy or just survive in, in many cases. But with more people, there's big, bigger cities. And some of these cities were uh, planned, right? Some of the newer cities were planned where you plan a street here, perpendicular here, and this is where the city center will be, and the streets are this wide. Uh, so a nice organized plan. Uh, but some of the earlier ones, like Boston, were a little bit more haphazardly organized, right? Because in the beginning, you just build a church here, and you build a house in a here, and a courthouse here, whatever, and then you got to build the streets around it. So it wasn't as well organized. But these cities, these bigger cities with a larger population, they became stratified. And not by law, but just by nature, I suppose, with the, the merchants at the top, the, the, the elite, the, the, the rich business owners at the top, and then the, the small shopkeepers in the middle. And at the bottom, you had uh, the, the slaves, and then you also had the indentured servants, and you also had the poor workers. So the cities were becoming uh, stratified in the 1700s. There's, this, there's also this idea of mercantilism. Now, mercantilism, it's important because just pay note, in this, in this presentation today, we're going to really show you a lot of things that lead up to the American Revolution, which is going to lead up to a new country, which is the United States of America. But mercantilism um, was the idea where Britain was going to use the colonies um, to enrich themselves, really. Uh, maybe put another way is the the purpose of the colonies was to to um, serve the mother country and the mother country of course was Britain so that was the purpose of the colonies that was the idea right they would send raw materials lumber and whatnot so they could build things they could manufacture things and then sell them or maybe tobacco so they could sell tobacco um, this idea came in the late 1600s in the early 1600s it's known as solitary neglect and this is when the colonies were new. This land wasn't really considered that valuable. The Caribbean was the more valuable land because it had sugar. Um, but, you know, the land between Massachusetts and <clears throat> Virginia was really kind of worthless, right? Uh, kind of swampy in some areas. They didn't find gold or silver like the Spanish did. Um, so they let the, 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 the English colonies develop kind of independently in the early 1600s. But then they started to control them more. They realized this is valuable land. Um, and some of this control is going to continue and it's going to explode <clears throat> in 1775 when the, the American Revolution begins. But just realize that this idea of mercantilism where the colonies were there for the sake of the British. Now, we talked about the, the consumers society <clears throat> and people having the, the ability to buy things, right? Before they couldn't. <clears throat> uh, the, the, the colonies were too undeveloped. But where does money come from? Uh, I mean, that's just a question we could ask today. Like, if you use the U.S. dollar <clears throat> or the British pound or Chinese yuan, why do people accept these pieces of paper to 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 buy something valuable, like a phone, like an iPhone? <clears throat> just paper. It's not backed by anything. It used to be backed by gold. So you could take in your paper money or your note and exchange it for gold, right? Or just trade the paper money and then somebody else could exchange it for gold. But now it's not. Now it's backed by a strong governments, trust in governments. People trust it. And it's as simple as that. If they stop trusting it, there could be a problem. And if they keep printing it, that could be another problem. But where does money come from in British America, at least? Every country is a little bit different. But in British America, <clears throat> uh, the British... They couldn't go there and just use their American pounds to trade with the Native Americans. The Native Americans would have looked at them like they're crazy. So they wanted them to use they wanted to use gold and silver, and they did actually. They used the Spanish dollar uh, because remember the Spanish were there for over a hundred years before the for the English came. So the Spanish dollar was circulating, and 
it was silver and people found value in it, people were use, willing to exchange it for another good or service. So they used the Spanish dollar, right? And they, they didn't find the gold and silver that they were hoping to. So the Spanish dollar would suffice. But they used other things. They had the barter system, right? If you have two pigs and I have a, a cow and you want my cow and I want your two pigs, we could barter. But not, not every time people were, um, maybe I don't want the two pigs. I want something else. So you can't make the exchange. So you still need that medium of exchange. So in addition to the Spanish dollar, other things were used, commodities, right? Uh, one, for example, was wampum. Wampum was used by Algonquian peoples uh, in the in, in what is now in, was in British America. And there was these special shells that were difficult to find in the ocean, and they would make necklaces out of them and decorate them. <clears throat> and they were scarce, so that gave them value, and the Native Americans valued it, right? So, I mean, to a Dutch settler or a British settler, they might not really find value in it, but the natives found value in it. So they would collect it and they would use it to trade for goods or services that they needed, right? That's all it is, is, is money. It was scarcity, right? But an interesting story is, what did the Dutch do? Well, they thought, well, these people, these Native Americans like this. I can buy some fur with this. Uh, so let's get a lot of wampum. So they would go into the ocean with their advanced technology and they would dig out a whole bunch of wampum or these shells that could make wampum. And what happens when you have so many shells or so much wampum? What come, becomes of the value of the wampum? It goes to zero. That's why today when people are worried about the printing of the U.S. dollar or the Chinese yuan, they're worried that something like this could happen, right? So you can learn from history. But the wampum became useless, uh, worthless, right? They also use tobacco. They use whiskey. They use land. Many different commodities throughout history have been used. Um, it's just something of value that people, it's a medium of exchange, it's in the middle. You give me this, you give me this, and, and we're all happy, right? But tobacco, even if you didn't smoke, you could use it to trade because somebody else did smoke and they found value in it. Look at today's prison system. What is the currency in the prison system? Well, cigarettes. So even if you don't smoke, you wanna collect as many cigarettes as possible because somebody else does smoke and they will accept it in exchange for a good or service. And even if they don't smoke, they'll still accept it because they can trade it to somebody else who does or somebody else. I mean, it goes on and on. So the the, the, the cigarette is, is the value. The tobacco is the value in the prison system. It was the same in, in British America. Um, but they would eventually print some money and there'd be problems that. They print too much. At first, it was fiat money, so it wasn't backed by gold. Remember, the gold standard is when a note or a currency is backed by gold, so you can exchange that note for that gold. It gave that, that, that paper value. But they didn't, that was a problem in British America. So people printed too much and it lost value. But also, if you have a, a note from New York and you want to go to Massachusetts or Pennsylvania, that note or that money doesn't work. And there's no place it's just to exchange Pennsylvania notes for New York notes. So you have a pile of money going into another colony, it's worthless. Also, counterfeit was rampant at the time. It was easier to counterfeit this money. So this currency made it possible for people to buy stuff, but there was problems with it. You know, a standardized colonial currency was available, which, you know, hampered um, trade. But within the colonies, they, they could use it. Uh, later in 1751 and 1763, this would be, this would be after the, the, the Seven Years' War, the, the British, you know, their traders came for many years and they didn't trust the colonial money for the reasons I just mentioned, right? Uh, they couldn't just bring it back to, to Britain and use it, right? Or they couldn't use it in different colonies or it lost a lot of value. So they, they did uh, enforce the Currency Acts of 1751-1763 where they encouraged the, the colonists to, to use species or gold or silver. Now, this currency act, plus the other problems with not having the standard currency, would negatively affect trade in the colonies. But this, plus other acts, which we'll talk about here, are also going to uh, increase the anger in, uh, uh, of the colonists. Because remember, in the early 1600s and mid-1600s, they had solitary neglect, where they were left alone. And then as time went on, as it became a mercantilist, um, or practice mercantilism where they were just used to, to help the motherland. There's more and more control by the British and uh, they would pass 
acts, like the Navigation Act, where the, the colonists could only trade with the British. Uh, they also passed um, the Currency Act, just more forms of control that would anger the colonists, who were kind of independent thinking adventurers, if you will. Uh, but other acts like the Stamp Act, the Sugar Act, the Townshead Acts, which we'll talk about more later, uh, a lot of these were passed after the Seven Years' War to pay for the war debt, but these are just more examples of more control by the British, which is going to lead to the American Revolution, right? So uh, no, taxation, no taxation without representation. You know, all these taxes are going to make them angry, but it's starting to, to unfoil here. Now, slavery is uh, an important topic, um, a very uh, uh, influential topic in, in American history. And the institution of slavery, if you look at my last video, I talked about slavery more in the 1600s when, uh, you know, there were indentured servants and African slaves, and sometimes African slaves were indentured servants where they could win their freedom. But by the 1700s, uh, Africans as slaves had been codified basically into law where Africans were slaves and their children were slaves. So this is a, uh, an institution in, in British America that will have long-term effects in the history of America, but the contribution Africans uh, made uh, throughout history is uh, cannot be denied. Uh, but their slavery, especially in the South, right, in the plantations, you know, the hard work on these large plantations uh, took a lot of labor, and they, they really built the South. In the North, slavery wasn't as, it was legal, right? So when America began in 1776, slavery was legal in all 13 colonies, but shortly after, the North would um, abolish slavery. They would make it illegal. There were people speaking out against slavery way back in the 1700s, like the Quakers. Um, but in the South, it was very prominent. Uh, if you look at this chart, Virginia, 40% of the population was enslaved. South Carolina, Carolina, more than 50%. Massachusetts, only 2%. So this kind of shows you what's going to lead up to the American Civil War. There was no demand in the North, and there was a huge demand in the South. And people knew slavery was, was, was bad, and it needed to be abolished. But the South became so dependent on it, it would eventually lead to American Civil War in, in, in the 1860s. But starting now, the North, it's just, it's just there, there's not as many slaves, and there's, there's freed blacks in the North uh, in, in different places. New York had a large... Uh, slave population, but places like Massachusetts, from looking at this chart, did not. Um, and naturally, it can be ex expected that slaves would revolt. I mean, just imagine living a life, uh, you know, trapped in labor. Uh, you would think that the Africans would, would fight back, and they will, right? There's going to be lots of examples um, in the 1700s, but also in the 1800s that are going, of the, of the slaves fighting back for, for their rights. Uh, one is the New York Slave Revolt. And the New York Slave Revolt was, uh, what happened in New York, and what was it, I have to look at my notes. So some, some African slaves, they were, well, it was, first of all, in New York, there was a larger slave population for the North, not compared to the South, but it was significant. And they worked as skilled laborers, and they worked in uh, small businesses, or maybe in, in, in a house. But they were very close to each other, and they could communicate, and they could they could conspire to 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 start a revolt like the New York Slave Revolt of 1712. Uh, but there was 23 enslaved men who set fire to a building in New York, and when people went to set to to put out that fire, they attacked them, and uh, they killed them, and they they would they would be caught, they would be executed. So this was the New York Slave Revolt. But the Stono Rebellion in 1739 was even more significant. That happened in South Carolina. In South Carolina, well, you know, in South Carolina, you have the big plantations. And in the South, you have a lot of mosquitoes. And on these plantations, you have a lot of mosquitoes. And malaria was a big fear. So a lot of the African slaves that came to South Carolina in that area where they were cultivating rice came from the Congo and different places in the western parts of Africa where they had become immune to, uh, to malaria in, that, in those areas, they had a lot of mosquitoes. And they were also good at cultivating rice. So a lot of them came to this area in South Carolina purposely to, to, to do this. And they would work on the plantation where the plantation owners during the season when there's lots of mosquitoes would be in the big cities in their nice little houses staying away from the bugs and the malaria while the African slaves who were coming from a certain area in Africa were immune to it. 
Uh, and there, of course, would be an overseer or a leader watching over the slaves. But they, like the ones in New York, also conspired. It was on a Sunday when the, the slave owners were at church that uh, 80 of them, I believe, uh, 80 slaves armed themselves. They, they raided a little store and got some weapons. And they were making their way to Spanish Florida, killing white, uh, white colonists along the way. Now, why were they going to New Spain? Because New Spain, like I said in the last video, if you watched it, they had slaves well before the, the, the British did in British America. Well, the S Spanish were, were Catholics and the British were Protestant, most of them, not everybody. And if you know anything about history of the Catholics and the British or the Protestants, they don't get along, so they would fight. Right, you see lots of examples in history, like in 1588 with the Spanish Armada, and uh, um, there's going to be, you know, the French and the colonists are going to fight as well. But uh, they, they, they're enemies, right? The, the, the British are fearful of Spanish. They're fearful of Spanish attacks, and then and the Spanish are fearful of the growing power of the British to their north. So they had a colony called uh, Fort Mose Colony, where they would let um, freed slaves or runaway slaves who made it to Spain, New Spain, which is in Florida, right on the border, let them live freely. So Native or African Americans heard about this this, this uh, freed uh, colony and they would try to escape uh, to their freedom. And that's what they did in the Stoner Rebellion. They almost made it and, and, and they didn't make it. Um, they would they would be captured and they would be they would be executed. Some of them would be executed. Uh, but the important point here is that the, the Africans did fight back for their freedom at different points. These are some of the more prominent slave rebellions. And of course, the most prominent one is in Haiti, where the Haitians or the slave, it was owned by the French, the slaves revolted, they fought back, and they won, right? They won, and the French were kicked out, and the, and the, the, the freed slaves started their own country, which is still there today, Haiti. Um, Another important point here is this is in the 1700s, but into the 1800s in the South, as slavery grew, right? You know, the, the, the founding fathers thought slavery would become less after the founding of the country and the Constitution. They didn't make it illegal in the Constitution. Some wanted to, but they were worried about making the South angry. Uh, a lot of people thought slavery would end or just slowly disappear, but it slowly increased in the 1800s because of cotton. And fears of a slave revolt, like the New York Slave Revolt or the Stono Rebellion or what happened in Haiti would be a constant fear of, um, of the Southerners, especially I think of South Carolina, where more than 50% of the population are African slaves. So that would be a continuous fear. And if you know what happens in the American Civil War, just before that, John Brown went to Harper's Ferry to steal some weapons to weaponize and give it to the slaves so they could fight for their freedom. And this is one of the big, um, events that would lead to the, to the American Civil War. Okay, let's talk about the different type of governments in colonial America or in British America. Of course, they're influenced by the, by the British, right? Uh, there'd be a lot of influence from the politics from, from the British, and the British own them. Let's not pretend like they don't, they own them, right? Even in the beginning when it was solitary neglect, the British owned them. Um, but each government, had uh, an executive branch, which is the governor, the legislative branch, which is usually an elected lawmaking uh, branch, and then the courts, the judicial branch. This was this is similar to what you see in the United States today, with some differences, obviously. But in the beginning, there are three different colonies. Uh, sorry here. In, in the beginning, there are the there's a royal colony or a provincial colony. And this is one that is appointed by the crown, by the king or queen in, uh, in, in, in Britain. And yeah, so the people didn't have a choice. It was, it was, they, they, they made sure the colony ran like they following English law. The second one is a proprietary colony. Uh, you know, some of the colonies were proprietary colonies because basically the king, like King Charles uh, of England, would give it to his friends or people he owned favors to, like Pennsylvania and William Penn. He's a proprietor. Basically, he's a business owner or a landowner. He owned the colony. It's like a business in a way. And he would appoint the governor. 
The charter one is was was also like a business. This was like the joint stock companies, like the Virginia Company, which was also like a business where they people would invest in this colony or this expedition. And if it was successful and it uh, grew tobacco or made some money, people would make money on their investment. If it failed, they would all lose money, right? Uh, Virginia was like that, but Virginia would eventually become a royal colony later. Uh, but these are the three different colonies. Uh, basically, the governor was chosen differently. One was chosen by the crown, another was by the, the owner, the proprietor. The other one is chosen by the, the, the people, the colonists. Um, but they also had their legislative branch and their judicial branch. And it was different a little bit in each of the colonies. Um, but this is a general overview of what the, what the, what the structure looked like in uh, the British, British America. Now, an important thing um, is uh, enlightenment. So uh, this happened in Europe uh, and it influenced the British America. You know, I have people called Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson part enlightenment thinkers. They're the, they're the American counterpart to the enlightenment. But this happened in the late 1600s and 1700s. And the Enlightenment thinkers, they, they influenced politics. They influenced how people looked at um, uh, the world. They questioned religion, you know, questioned the Catholic Church and the Pope and the all-powerful church or the all-powerful king or queen. Um, new ideas came about. And these new ideas are going to change Europe, but they're also going to change British America and, will, and influence what will become the United States of America. Now, there are many hundreds of these Enlightenment thinkers, some more prominent than others, but some of the more famous ones include Thomas Hobbes, and he was English, and he came up with other thinkers, this idea of the social contract. And it's this idea of what individual freedom should be uh, sacrificed so we, we follow social norms, right? So we can have a stable, safe society. We have to give up some liberties. Uh, so we listen to some some type of government, um, but this government needs to be consented by the people, right? So you can't just have some all-powerful king, um, divine, and whatever he says goes. No, that can be questioned, right? But you do need some type of social contract. And what should that social contract be to have uh, a profitable, safe, stable society? Now, when it comes to American history, John Locke is possibly the most important. He was also English, and he talked about these natural rights, like natural rights uh, to your life, to, to your liberty, and to protecting your property. And his idea was that uh, it's not the government's job to tell you everything you have to do, but it's their job to protect these rights, these natural rights, right? This is obviously going to be important when it comes to the Bill of Rights and the Constitution, these natural individual rights that the Constitution would offer Americans later. There's also the idea uh, from Montesquieu, who was French, who talked about uh, checks and balances. Uh, so the, the executive, the legislative, and the judiciary branch would, if one gets too powerful, they would, they would control them, right? They wouldn't let one get too powerful. They had to, to they had to work together, right, and have a balance. And this would be true in the colonies, in the British colonies. They would have these checks and balances. Um, but of course, some governors got a little bit too powerful. So, so the Enlightenment is important because it's these new ideas, these new these new uh, ideas on how people should be governed uh, that, are, that are popping up in the late 1600s and in the, in the 1700s. And it's going to influence the, 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 the thoughts and the ideas in British America, uh, especially when forming a new government after the American Revolution. And just to show you the importance, John Locke said, life, liberty, and property looks very familiar to Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness by Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence, 1776. So you can see the direct influence on what would become the United States of America. Okay, we also have print culture. Uh, and printing was very important, especially in the 1700s. That's where people learned about what was happening uh, in other colonies in, in Britain. Information was slow, but this is where they got their information. Um, and there was important print shops, and people depended on the newspaper or bulletins or newsletters. 
Um, but there was a high degree of censorship in the different colonies. Uh, lots of information was censored. So if you remember my last video, I talked about the Glorious Revolution, the 1600s, when they peacefully um, ch changed the king and queen to William and Mary. And there was a lot of censorship in like New York and different colonies because the governor didn't want the colonists to get any bad ideas. So they would censor that. They tried to hide it. But they found out. And the British would be angry about this censorship. Uh, but nonetheless, the printing capital was in Boston, but Benjamin Franklin in 1770 would move it to Philadelphia. And of course, this print culture would lead to the American Revolution, right? It's the, 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 the sharing of ideas. The you know picture of the Boston Massacre, which is going to infuriate the colonists and want to fight the war. It's these printed pieces that's going to unite the colonists against the British. Uh, another example is in the 1600s was the Baker's Rebellion. Uh, the governor, William Berkeley, he didn't believe that people should be just taught anything in school. He didn't want people to read in the newspapers because they would revolt, right? They would, they would go against the government. He wanted them to stay stupid in a way. I think that's fairly accurate. And he censored the newspapers. But ironically, Nathaniel Bacon used the print culture and, and, and the, uh, the printing press to disseminate information and to gather and unite and fight and take down, really, the Virginia government at the time. Uh, and uh, after William Berkeley died, they opened up about the printing, right? But there was still censorship throughout the colonies all the way to 1776. But in 1734, Here's a good example of censorship. There's a journalist. His name was John Zenger. He was a journalist and printer, and he printed some pretty nasty stuff about William Cosby, one of the, the, the governor of, uh, of New York. And he was arrested. Uh, Cosby said, this is libel. You can't just write whatever you want. You know, you can't defame me. So he was arrested, and he went in front of, of a jury. And it's important while you're understanding American history or British history, the importance of a jury. If there's no jury selected among our, the citizens, then Cosby could just put him, or, could just arrest him for, as a political prisoner, not give him the right to defend himself. That's why we have juries. That's why it's important. That's why it's important to understand the judicial system. So when something terrible happens in society, no matter what it is, and we want justice, it takes some time. They, people need to be able to defend themselves. Otherwise, the government, like they do in some countries, will just arrest you and the government will say, oh yeah, you're, you're guilty and you're in jail for the rest of your life because you're a political prisoner. You're a threat to their power. But nonetheless, Cosby put him in jail or put him on, in court so he's going to defend himself. And uh, the jury found he was innocent. It took him 10 minutes and they said, well, what he wrote or published in the newspaper was true. So he was innocent. Why is the Zenger trial important? Well, this is in 1734, less than 50 years before the American Revolution, and this sets the precedent for um, a free press in the U.S. later. Censorship is going to continue in the colonies, but this is kind of the first feel of the freedom of the press, right? And, of course, you know in America now you can print anything. In fact, you can print libel. It doesn't have to be true these days, right? But that's the idea. Okay, so now I want to talk about the Great Awakening. Uh, if you go to America today, you will see churches everywhere, and obviously Christianity and religion, it's, uh, you can practice any religion you like or no religion at all in the United States today, but obviously religion has a, a strong effect on what America has become, and there's no different in British America. Uh, from the early years with the Puritans in Massachusetts, uh, with their Puritan Calvinist religion, is very strong and very, very strict in the Northeast. And also the Anglican Church down, you know, in the South or the mid, uh, you know, Virginia area, uh, and other Protestant religions and the Quakers. Religion has always had a strong influence on uh, on British America. But of course, with the the Enlightenment, people started to challenge uh, the church. They they challenge the authority of the church. They challenge. Um, you know, why should I believe in God? Or what influences should have a society? Uh, people are going to church less, right? It's becoming much more lenient in Massachusetts. At one time, you couldn't practice Christmas there. You couldn't dress up and dance and enjoy Christmas. And then that was slowly changing. 
But uh, with these changes, some people were driven away from the church, more towards consumerism, buying things, right? Uh, and and um, sinful acts, as, as a lot of people would have said back then. Uh, but also it's the Enlightenment. It's be, it was being challenged. So this is like a counter-Enlightenment in a way where the colonists were trying to bring the colonists, uh, you know, the, the preachers or the leaders, the religious leaders were trying to bring the colonists back to church, back to God. And that is what the, the Great Awakening is. This is the 1730s and 1740s. And this is kind of like a cont continu continuity, something that continues in uh, British and American history that continues to influence uh, what the, the country is today. Um, and the religious leaders, uh, they would they would preach and they would travel. They were called itinerant uh, preachers. And they would go from colony to colony, north to south, and they would preach and gather crowds of like a thousand people or up to 10,000 people. And uh, some of these preachers were very good orators. They could speak very well and act and really influence the crowd. So this brought the colonists uh, in British America back to church, right? Uh, it really, it, it created a new denomination of Protestant, Protestantism called Methodists. Um, so this is very important and influential part of, of American history. So this is a revival of Christianity in uh, British America. And two of the most famous ones uh, are Jonathan Edwards, and George Whitefield. Now Edwards, he wrote or he spoke sinners in the hands of an angry God, where he talks about you need to be, you need to come to God so you can be forgiven <laughs> uh, for your sins. And it's almost like a scary, I'll read a little bit in the next slide, but it's, a little, it's almost a little scary, a little threatening. If you don't follow this, you're gonna be going to hell. Uh, but he was, you know, he was very conservative. He was a, he believed in Calvinism. He kind of like the, the, the the Puritans from from earlier, uh, and he didn't travel up and down the the coast, but he was in the churches, and he was very influential and influenced a lot of other preachers to also preach the word of God. Uh, and he's considered the founding one of the fathers uh, of the Great Awakening in British America. And the other one is George Whitefield. He was an itinerant preacher, and he would go up and down the the, the coast of British America from Massachusetts to South Carolina. And during the Great Awakening, he preached 350 times or more. That's just during the Great Awakening, thousands of times in his lifetime, right? He started in Britain, and then he came over for the during the Great Awakening. But he was very influential. He used to be an actor. He's theatrical. The way he spoke, he would spasm his body, and all the people listening would also spasm. Uh, you can only imagine what it was like there, right? Even Benjamin Franklin, who was a deist or an atheist or a non-believer or questioned Christianity, went to one of his sermons and he spoke highly of this guy. It's, it's amazing how he could just ignite the crowd. And I think you can see that today with, with public speakers or motivational speakers or, or kind of these mega churches. It's something similar to that. Uh, but I guess attending one of these things must have been amazing. Just, just, just a thousand or thousands of people just spasming and getting all frenzied over, over listening to George Whitefield. But George Whitefield spoke to, to everybody. He also spoke to Native Americans and African Americans. I mean, imagine being an African American at that time, living in slavery, but able to come watch one of these or hear about one of these sermons. It gave them hope, right? The, the little hope they had at the time, but uh, it did give some African Americans hope. And of course, Christianity would be important in the African American community um, at that time and, and later on in, in history. <clears throat> But I'll read this real quick. But you can. This is uh, this is sinners in the hands of God by the by Jonathan Edwards. I just took a couple excerpts. But the first one is 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 kind of the fear mongering, and the second one is kind of more hopeful. Mm -hmm. But he says that world of misery, that lake of burning brimstone, is extended abroad under you. There is the dreadful pit of the glowing flames of the wrath of God. There is hell's wide gaping mouth open. And you have nothing to stand upon, nor anything to take hold of. There is nothing between you and hell but the air. It is only the power and mere pleasure of God that holds you up. So this is kind of the fear-mongering. But then here it's a little more hopeful at the end. 
And now you have an extraordinary opportunity, a day wherein Christ has flung the door of mercy wide open and stands in the dark, calling and crying with a loud voice to poor sinners, a day wherein many are flocking to him and pressing into the kingdom of God. Many are daily coming from the east, west, north, and south. Many that were very lately in the same miserable condition that you are in, are in now a happy state with their hearts filled with love to him that has loved them and washed them from their sins in his own blood and rejoicing in hope of the glory of God. How awful is it to be left behind at such a day to see so many others feasting while you are pinning and perishing, to see so many rejoicing and singing for joy of heart while you have cause to mourn for sorrow of heart and how for vexation of spirit how can you rest one moment in such a condition? So it shows you how influential this will be. If you don't do this, you're going to you're going to hell, right? But you have a choice. You come 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 ask God for forgiveness of your sins. So this is kind of the. I think this is a little more threatening than uh, than George Whitefield, right? George Whitefield might have been a little bit more optimistic, but here this this gives some people hope, right? I'm a sinner, and this gives me a chance. Uh, but the important point here is the Great Awakening continues the, the idea of uh, religion in British America. But not only that, uh, old ideas are questioned, just like the Enlightenment. Old ideas are questioned. And, and again, we're, we're leading up to the American Revolution, where all old ideas are being questioned. That's kind of the purpose of this, of this presentation. And that's where we are. Uh, we're going to be leading up to the the, 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 the Seven Years' War. Um, we have a British America that's developing over a period of 150 years, 13 colonies, right? Uh, people that are adventurous, that are striving to improve their lives, religious, right? Uh, people that question authority and the Enlightenment, in Great Awakening, also in some of the rebellions, like the Bacon's Rebellion in 1676, which happened earlier, they're questioning and they're challenging authority. Uh, and you also have a British government that is more and more controlling the Navigation Acts, the Currency Act. And then now we have a war. It's a seven years' war, right? So it's not just the British that are, are in the New World. There's many countries. I mean, it's the Dutch, it's the Swedes, it's the Finns. Uh, but three of the major countries or colonies is New Spain, which is in Florida and Mexico and the West, which is powerful, been there for more than 100 years, 200 years by the time, more than 200 years by the time the revolution begins. You also have the French. The French are in Canada. I mean, why do they speak French in French Canada? Because they used to be French. Uh, and the French are to the West uh, along the Mississippi and as more and more people come, whether it be the French or the British, now there's a lot more British than French. The French have a lot more territory, but they're more widespread, right? And they're, they're, they're friendlier with the Native Americans. They assimilate and, and share each other's cultures and trade with the Native Americans. But they're getting more and more French coming, and they're going to go into areas that the British think is their area. And the British are going to do the same thing. There's more and more, and they're on the coast there. They're kind of trapped. They want to go west. The cities are getting fuller. They want to go west. And there's some very valuable territory that the British think is theirs and the French thinks is theirs. And just like with the Native Americans, there's going to be conflict, right? Especially when you got a Catholic France and a, and a, and a Protestant uh, Britain. They don't get along, right? There's many examples of the Catholics and the Protestants fighting each other. And this is another one of them, right? But there was some, some, some disputes over territories, like uh, some forts, like Fort Duquesne, which is now Pittsburgh. Uh, and the British told them to get out, or they tried to get them to go out. And in fact, it was on one expedition where the, the, the French were asked to get out, and shots were fired, and the war began. That would begin the Seven Years' War. Uh, and one of the young people on that expedition was a 21-year-old uh, named George Washington. So this is where we're introduced to George Washington in American history. Uh, but this would be one of the early conflicts. And it would start the Seven Years' War. And this is a, a, like, really like the First World War. It's going to happen in uh, the, the Americas. It's going to happen in India, in Europe. It's going to be all over. But it's going to start in, in America over disputed land between the French and between the, between the British. 
Um, yeah, but here's George Washington, so this is where we're introduced to him. <clears throat> but without going over the details of the battles, uh, the French are winning the war at the beginning, right? Um, now, the British, they don't send a lot of troops because there's a war about to start in, in Europe, and it's the same war. It's a Seven Years' War. It's just an extension. So the, the British troops are going to be busy in Europe, and they're going to be fighting with the Prussians. They're going to be fighting against the Spanish and the French. And uh, the war, uh, the British are going to successfully help the Prussians and get over. There's a, a territorial dispute um, in, in named Silesia over in, uh, in the Prussian area. But they, they are going to be successful there. And after they're successful, the British are going to send their troops to, the, to, to help the, their colonists fight in, uh, in, in, the, in America. And when they send more troops, that is going to be the defeat of the of the French. So I know I went through that quickly, but uh, without going into all the details of the battles and uh, the strategies and whatnot, the British won. And as I showed you in the, the prior map, if you see on the, the top here, now all that territory that used to be uh, the French is now the British. So this is due to the, the Treaty of Paris in 1763. It was negotiated with, uh, with the French. The Spanish also fought in it, so that's part of, uh, that's part of the negotiation. Uh, the, the British, they're going to have all that territory. It's all marked in red and pink there. And the French are going to have some Caribbean islands. In fact, the French only wanted the Caribbean islands. They thought Canada, Quebec, ah, it's too cold up there. You, know, you can't cultivate sugar. It's the, it's the Caribbean that's the most valuable. Um, but the British Empire is, is huge, and too huge, uh, too much to manage. And this is going to lead to the American Revolution. That's the important point here. Now, who was not at the Treaty of Paris? You get the French there, you got the Spanish, you got the English, the, the British, the Native Americans aren't there. There's still Native Americans all in this territory that the, now belongs to Britain. That's going to cause a problem, because the French, um, surely there was conflicts between the French and the Native Americans, but overwhelmingly they, they, they traded, they shared each other's cultures, uh, they worked together, right, to benefit each other. But the British wouldn't be so friendly with the Native Americans. And now they have all this territory, they just fought, the brothers and fathers died and they fought, and now they can move to the west where the French were, that's why they fought the war, right? And that's what they're going to do, as more people come, they're going to settle to the west, but there's the Native Americans. And the Native Americans, they got along with the French much better, but now you got these British who don't get along with the Native Americans, who are just taking their territory. Settlers moving west. Uh, settlers who generally just want to have a better life, but they're taking more and more, taking the land of these Native Americans. And with the Native Americans, there was a problem uh, right from the beginning. I mean, right from the Spanish, they never united, right? And they were decimated by disease, and that's going to continue. But especially in the beginning, it would spread throughout North America. Uh, the amount of death from disease was um, was awful, right? Uh, but another problem is the Native Americans, there are so many different tribes and cultures, and they often fought each other. And sometimes they support the French or the Spanish or the or the British, but they were not they were not like one united Native American tribe that would uh, could fight the British, and that 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 would weaken them. Uh, and there's going to be some examples like to come today a little bit later. In the, in the 1800s, but Pontiac is also going to be one of the leaders that is going to unite different different tribes uh, to to push back against the British settling in, into their country. Um, but some of the tribes will include like the Ottawa, the Shawnee, the Delaware, the Iroquois, Iroquois and there's going to be more. Uh, but they are going to unite and fight back, and it's actually going to be successful. This is going to be one example where it's successful because King George III is over there in Britain, and he's hearing about Native American attacks on settlers, right? Maybe massacring a small settlement, or the, the you know the, a war that is happening in in the West in this new new territory, and he doesn't want to fight a war. He just fought the Seven Years' War. He's in debt. He doesn't want to mess with a war. So what does he do? He naturally says, "Okay, well, let's put a line." The Appalachian Mountains, that's called the Proclamation of 1763. There's a line here. So settlers, you can't go past that line. You can't go past the Appalachian Mountains and settle new lands. All right, makes sense because you don't want to fight the, the Native Americans, and it's their land. <laughs> that should be mentioned as well. Um, so, okay, we, that's our territory, but 
don't go past this these mountains. And of course, some settlers would still do it. But this is going to anger the, the, the colonists because they're going to say, my brother just died in this war. I fought in this war. I saw people die. I fought for the British. I was proud to be British. I fought the French, and we won. And why did we fight this war? Because they were encroaching on our land in the Ohio River Valley. We went there to stop them. They kept encroaching on our land. We fought a war with them, the Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War. And we won. And my brothers died. And now you're telling me I can't go to that land we just fought for? 1763. Twelve years later, there's going to be the American Revolution. This is the beginning, okay? Uh, my, my next video, uh, I'll talk about all the acts and all, all the events that's going to lead directly up to the first shots fought at Lexington and Concord. But this is the beginning of, um, of the, the dissatisfaction of the colonists towards the British. Now, like I said, it was before. There's more and more control. The Navigation Acts in 1651, right? Mercantilism, Currency Acts. Censorship. There's more and more controlled by the British by this time. So it, it, it's been building. But this is this is going to set it off. This is going to make them angry. But the other thing is, you have to remember is, they just fought a war. That's why I did the Proclamation of 1763. It makes sense. But what does it cost for a war? It costs a lot of money. Who's going to pay for that money? Where are they going to get the money from? Well, they're going to tax people. Who are they going to tax? Well, King George III says, well, let's tax the... Colonists, we just helped them. We just sent all these troops over there and defended them against the French and against their native allies. They should pay for it. And, and they're going to do it. Stamp Act, Sugar Act, Townshed Act, all these acts, all these taxes on the, on the British Americans uh, without representation in the British government. Within their local governments, sure, but not in the parliament, not in the British government. And it's going to lead to a war. So that'll be, that'll be the next class. So I hope you enjoyed it. If you made it to this far, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, but again, if you if you if if you think this presentation is nice and or the timeline, or so, I have a lot of primary source activities, uh, whether you're a teacher or you're just a student and want to learn. So please please see my store underneath. All right. Bye bye.